Welcome to the Semi-Retired Podcast with your hosts, Richard Bonomo. And me, Dave Farron. Richard, how are you doing this week? I'm doing okay in this rather Arctic-like weather. It's so cold, we've put toques on the microphones. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. So we have it. <laughs> but we're toasty warm here inside the Semi-Retired Studio and ready to talk about uh, one of our mutual loves in life, which is photography. So it's going to be a deep dive into photography. We've prepared a series of questions, which we're going to ask each other to see where our opinions differ or maybe we're on the same page and we'll talk about photography in general the philosophy of it what makes a photograph what makes a photographer is gear important just to say if you're listening to this and you're not a photographer please don't tune out because it's not going to be a conversation about the technical aspects of photography it's more about the creative approach i think the creative approach to photography can be applied to a lot of things we do in life stick with us I think you'll enjoy the conversation. We promise no circles of confusion. You might define the entire podcast as a circle of confusion, (laughs) but certainly that will not be talked about. So Richard, how do we get the ball rolling? Okay, so let's start with a question. What was your first camera? My first camera, I'm holding it in my hand right here, as a matter of fact, was my parents' Brownie Hawkeye. I'm sure a lot of people know the Brownie Hawkeye. It's the iconic mid-century family camera. I found it in the basement of our house sometime in 1974 and took it on the family vacation in Prince Edward Island that year and turned out some lousy photographs, but at the same time became enamored with photography. And that's it rattling right next to the microphone. Right, yeah. So that's the little brown big light camera that you've probably seen in photos or on someone's shelf. The first camera I remember would be my mother's brownie, but not the little big light one. It was the more vertical one with the flash on top. It had a built-in flash. I'm not sure I've seen that. One. Thinking it was an avocado. Color. Of course it would be avocado. <laughs> be a little flash bulb in the top and take a That's the first camera I remember. It wasn't my camera. I think the first camera I had would have been a 110 Hanimax. In there, I have memories also of an Olympus Trip 35. But that was a bit later. But I think the Hanimax 110 would have been my first camera. If I use that same definition, my first camera came along the Christmas of that year, 1974. Started grade nine that year and had signed up for a mass media program, which was experimental. It involved teaching us basic photography, including black and white printing and processing and basic filmmaking with little wind up Super 8 movie camera, regular 8 movie cameras. And as a result of that, my parents got me a Minolta Hymatic 7S for Christmas. Don't need to look that up, kids, if you're not a photographer, but it's like a classic early 70s Japanese rangefinder camera. That's a nice program. We didn't have photography programs in the high school. I think what it was, I was in art. It was an option for art. So I either took art, so finger painting, I would have called it at the time, or this, and this seemed more practical. It seemed techy, and I like the idea of photography. Finger painting, would that would have put you in touch with your inner caveman? <laughs> Probably, yeah. In ways Today, I, we will it, yeah. spit on our hands. In ways I might not necessarily have enjoyed, but yes, it would have. To follow up, do you remember the first photograph you took? I seem to recall my brother and I making up a phony UFO in the backyard using a couple of plastic salad bowls my mother had, taping them back to back so they produced sort of a saucer-like shape, making some legs out of coat hangers oh, yeah. and hanging it from the, the line my mother would hang the washing on and photographing it. That might have been the first foray into photography. Does that photograph still exist? I doubt it. I wish it did. That'd be wild. It'd yeah. be something. And that's yeah. what started the whole UFO craze of the 70s is when that photo first got published, right? That's and- right yeah. And then yeah. we, we saw these mysterious blurred objects everywhere. Yeah, I sent it to MUFON. <laughs> no, actually, it didn't exist then. And they put it on the front cover of their monthly magazine. You brought them into existence by taking the photo. I'd like be. to think so. And yeah. do you have a, a memory of a, of a first photograph? No. No memory. I don't remember anything shot with the 110. I don't remember any photos taken with the Olympus Trip 35. Okay. I have no memory of those photos at all. If I have to go back to the first memory, I remember it would be, you know, started using cameras at work. I don't have copies copies of photos from back then. I have photos of my childhood, but none that I can say I took. I don't know what happened to all those photos. I have some, I think, in my storage area here that come from the class. I had three years of that, grades 9, 10, and 11. Mm-hmm. So there were projects in there that I would have taken photographs for that I oddly can't remember what the subject matter was. I seem to recall photographing overflowing garbage cans in the school or something like that, some sort of social <laughs> comment project, but nothing of any uh, any substance. Meanwhile, Peter McCabe... At the same time, our contemporary, that's right. He was shooting all those great high school shot time, right? That's depressing. You're right, eh? (laughs) Peter is a a world renowned photojournalist, photographs people excellently in in a way I wish I could, is a contemporary of ours. And yeah, seems to have started off on a slightly more productive path than we did. If we elaborate on that, what makes a photographer? Do you consider yourself a photographer, Dave? I do, in the sense that I feel I can, or I've developed over the year, 
years, the ability to produce an image using a camera that I think has some aesthetic value to it and is pleasing to look at. I'm not a photographer of specific subjects. You know, I'm not the kind of guy who wakes up and thinks, oh, I'll go down and photograph the Grand Prix this weekend. That's not me. I, I like to photograph more abstract subject matter than that. Not that I wouldn't do that, but that's kind of more me. I'm a trained graphic designer, and so I'm always looking for designs in the world around me, produced by shadows or the shapes of buildings or whatever. And if there happens to be something in there, then it's in there. But I'm not typically photographing a subject as much as a, a design. A photographer is someone who takes photos. In the in, simplest definition. In, yeah. in the simplest sense. So today, everybody has a camera in their pocket, or most people have a phone with them that has a camera built in. And so we have a mass of photographers throughout the world compared to 20 years ago, 30 years ago, Absolutely. 40 years ago. The growth is, is astronomical. Are those photographers? Do we consider that a photographer? Is there, and this is the part I want to get into, is there a snobby aspect to the whole photography thing? There's a distinction there, but I won't apply the term snobbery to it. I think that there's people who like to take pictures of their friends, the party they're at, famously the food they're eating. And so they record those scenes with a camera, but they're not trying to do what a photographer does. And again, I don't think this is snobby. It's more a question of intent, which is trying to produce an image that's got some more aesthetic value to it or communicates a feeling or an emotion or captures a, a moment in time. So I think it's intent that is the distinction. Again, I don't see that as snobbery as much as that's just the way it is. So if you're grabbing something for your Instagram feed or whatever, you're going to post something on Facebook and we have now the proliferation of meals. People who go oh, yes, and photograph, we do. you can follow someone and their entire feed is just... Food. <laughs> Just feed. Yeah, that's right. It's a food feed. They have an intent there where they're trying to capture something. This is what they're channeling. They're in a foodie and they're capturing their meals. In that sense... Are they photographers? Let's run this again. It's entirely possible to take aesthetically pleasing photographs of food if you put some effort into it. Not necessarily just pointing your camera at the pizza that's just been delivered, but paying attention to the lighting, paying attention to what else is in the scene as you're framing it, cleaning up the edges and corners of the composition. If you're just pointing your camera, whether it was a brownie Hawkeye back in the day or your iPhone at your pizza and snapping the lens so you can send this photograph and say, check out the delicious pizza I'm eating, I'm not going to define that as somebody who's trying to be a photographer. I'm going to say that's somebody who is, and it's completely legitimate, just wants to capture some images of the life they're leading so that they can show them to people around them, remember them later. That's fine. That's great. But I think a photographer, if you want to call yourself a photographer, you're putting in a bit more effort than that. And I call it snobbery, call it whatever you want. You often see people who deride cell phone images in that, yeah, I have a cell phone, but when I want to take a real picture, I take my real camera. Yeah, you do see that. And we were just talking about the video we watched today about a guy who was giving 13 cell phone tips. And for almost every tip, he put down the camera. Yeah. He put down the cell phone saying, oh, well, you know, because it's terrible in low light, always try to shoot in, in open light. Or because it's, you know, terrible for this, do that. We, we come across, especially when digital started coming out and purists didn't see digital cameras as being real cameras, right? There were toys. Well, because I the, remember that. The early cameras were terrible. I mean, look, we had, a, I think, a 0.7 megapixel uh, camera at work that, st that stored its images on a floppy drive. Those were terrible pictures, but it was a camera. And I've always made the argument that anything with a sensor is a camera, right? A scanner is a camera because it, sure. it takes a picture say in the same way that your cell phone does. If you were to go back... You know, with the arrival of 35 millimeter film, the medium format and large format shooters saw this as a toy. It was never going to take off, right? It's not real photography. It's not real photography unless you're making your own glass <laughs> and then coating it with chemicals exuded from your body or from a goat that you found basking in the sun. And you coat your own plates and then you develop them inside whatever. That doesn't sound like much fun at all to me. <laughs> to go back to your iPhone theme, and I know we maybe had a similar experience here. I will say, even though I started dabbling in photography in the 1970s. I didn't really get serious about it until the 21st century, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. My 20th century output is very shaky, very intermittent, not really great. What brought me to digital photography, you, Richard, had introduced our group of friends who were photographers to Instagram. And all I had at that point was an iPad. So I started using as a, which you can do as a camera, producing obviously low technical quality results, but some images that I was nonetheless proud of that I wouldn't have gotten if I'd been out there with my camera trying, quote unquote, to take a serious photograph. Mm -hmm. So I will credit the iPad and the iPhone as two photographic tools with which, number one, I had a whole lot of fun. More fun than I was having with my actual film cameras. They caused me to approach the photography differently and they loosened me up and they made me produce what I felt were effective images with a very limited 
technical tool set. And that was fine. All that stuff that people get overwhelmed with aren't there on the iPhone. Even as the apps got a little more sophisticated, they were still massively much more simple than using a camera. So I'm one of those people, and I know, I know we're alike on this, and I'm sure you're going to build on this, who think the iPhone is an absolutely tremendous camera. Yes, it's limited, but so what? You bring up a good point. I think it's the serendipity of it. The fact that you're not pulling out your camera and deciding which lens you're going to put on it. And are you going to use a filter and you're going to use yes. a lens hood? Oh, and do I want the 40 or do I want the 28? What am I going to do here? The 40 or the 50 yes. or the 45? Yes. And then you spend so much time scratching your head that you miss the moment. And I'm not saying there's not a time for those kind of things. If you're going out on, on a prolonged shoot or you're going out on a shoot, yeah, you, you, want to, you want to think these things through and bring some gear. The beauty of the iPhone and even to a certain extent, point and shoot cameras, which you're seeing popular now again on social media, on TikTok, on YouTube, you're seeing a lot of the stuff where people are buying old point and shoot film cameras, going at and just shooting with the camera. You don't see what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. It's the idea, the the journey of discovery of you're going to take a photo and whatever happens, happens. You kind of had that in the, the early cell phone cameras where you were going out and you knew it was limited, but the limitation was something that expanded your creativity. You had no choice but to work with it. Yes. And I don't want to say work around it. I think you have to work with it. I agree 100%. Yeah. And some of those early iPad shots, I mean, there's tons of those things that were, we were just screwing around. I remember us at Kelly's snapping lights, you know, moths in the lights. Some of those were terrible. I went back and deleted a bunch of them. But there was a joy in that. Again, it's in the same joy like when you give a camera to a small child and they go out and shoot. And they're just shooting for whatever. And you're like, well, no, what you should do, you should look through, make sure there's nothing in the corners. The kid doesn't know that. He yeah. points it, sees something you like, snaps the picture. Like, your horizon's off, right? <laughs> Yeah. Have you ever seen that curve? There's a graphic of quality of output. No. Uh, okay. I've seen this a long time ago. It's it's a typical, you know, XY graph. Yeah. And it shows the quality of your output. As a beginner, your quality is low. It starts to get really good until you become knowledgeable and then your quality drops again. <laughs> and then at some point it becomes good again. I, I think what it's trying to say is when you overthink what you're doing and overthink if people are gonna like it or overthink the process, you get lost in that and you forget to take photos. You forget to take photos for the pure enjoyment of taking photos. I think that's exactly correct. Yeah. Yes. You you get you get to a point where you shoot, shoot, shoot because these are things you like. And then once you start sharing your photos, you want the validation. The standard uh, validation for us would have been a camera club competition where you end up shooting for the judges as opposed to shooting for you. I'll always remember judging a competition one time and image came up and I said, wow, I really like this. Love the black and white treatment. And the person in the back said, I knew you were going to be a judge. So I, I shot this because I know you like this type of photo. A good way to score high, but what are you going to do with the image after if you only shot it for a competition and you don't have an attachment to it because you didn't shoot for yourself? I shoot for myself, honestly. If I like the image, that's really all that matters. I don't mean that to sound egocentric or self. It's just, that's why I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And if somebody else tells me they like it, for me, that's a fantastic bonus. Yeah. When I look back, some of my favorite photographs of the last 10 years, the period during which I was most productive as a photographer were taken with the iPhone. Not saying I didn't take photographs that I'm pleased with, with my full equipment sets. I've got a couple of camera bodies and multiple lenses now, and I enjoy going out with those broader tool sets. And I certainly get images I wouldn't get with the iPhone, but are they better images? I'm not sure. I think there's something else. Again, it comes back to serendipity for me. If I'm walking outside and I see an interesting shadow pattern, if I say, oh, and let me run home, grab my camera, come back out here sun's moved it's, it's gone. gone yeah the best camera is the one you have with you and i think whoever said that i can't remember who, who <laughs> said the original quote but today we all have a phone on us and most times i'll go out shooting with both and some shots i'll shoot with my camera and for some other things i'll pull out my phone and i'll shoot them on my phone because for whatever reason it's going to respond differently or i'm getting a different feeling from the phone and also there's the fact that if i shoot on my camera it means i got to pull the card out i got to stick it in the card reader i got to import it into something like lightroom work with it on the phone most times I rarely touch up the photos because I can get them where I want. I find it's easier to get in camera on the phone than I can on, on the camera. There's the immediacy and the intimacy I find is much more accessible on the cell phone. It's its own experience. I'm not sure I felt that same barrier with the technical side that you did, but I really did enjoy going out, taking a series of photographs with the iPhone, post-processing them on the iPhone in the apps, mm -hmm. and then perhaps sending them up onto Instagram so that those of us who were photography friends could look at them and get like a thumbs up from somebody or yeah. a great shot. That was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I was never a big post-processor 
processor anyways. Again, non-photographers, I know we're getting jargony here, stick with us. Post-processing is work you'll do on the image file after it's been shot on the camera. Sometimes that can be done in the iPhone or on the iPad. Sometimes you need to take that to your computer. It's some kind of cleaning up we're doing. To Photoshop it, as they would say. To Photoshop it, <laughs> the famous new age verb, exactly. I was never one for doing a lot of that. That's my style. I'm not uh, advocating that other people agree with that or do it, but I was always for minimal cleanup, bit of contrast, bit of sharpening. I always liked taking out little specks in the photograph. Yeah. Like like if there was a cigarette butt on the sidewalk in a photograph I was taking of some shadows, I'd, I'd get rid of the cigarette butt. To me, it wasn't yeah. part of my story. I'm a gardener that way. I, I clean up. So you garden before also? I've like gardened if before. You can? I've gardened yeah, before, yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I used to carry with me a, I still actually have it in my car, a thing called a plamp, P-L-A-M-P, okay. that you can attach to your tripod and out comes this little set of jaws and you can bring your subject. It's a question of placing it in front of the background you want. Yeah. Because yeah. maybe it's in front of something that's a little messy. So you just bend the little sucker over and take your photograph. So yeah. I was a gardener. I carry a scythe for the same reason. <laughs> <laughs> hey, a little Grim Reaper there, Richard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm banned from a few nature parks. Yeah, I'm sure you are. <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned that uh, Dave I think uh, maybe we should do a field trip uh, the just two, the two of us the two of us go out photograph pick a subject go out which photograph. we've never done by the way no we've never shot together no. well, well Perth we, yeah <laughs> there was Perth that's true and a couple of camera club events for yeah, sure yeah. yeah Perth was interesting a whole bunch of people we rented yeah. was it one or two buses yeah we drove out to Perth in Ontario, three yes. hours away. And we went to photograph this quaint little village that you had found. Yeah. You and I uh, went out and shot a little bit. And then we ended up at the pub the entire yeah. time, the, drinking yeah. the rest of the afternoon. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I was in this yeah. phase at this point where I was really uptight taking my photographs. I was digital, a couple of years maybe past the iPhone phase, but I was really, I was not loose. There's a few photographs from that trip that I have that I, I can remember, but nothing memorable at all. I have a few interesting ones that I've uh, posted here and there. Uh, some by the water. You remember they were doing a fireman training exercise yeah, yeah. and they had those big dummies that you yeah. had to pick. He had the big hook in his head. Right. Yeah. yeah. I got a few shots of that. What I remember from that trip and it, it is photography related, I promise, is I had my iPad yeah. with me and in the back of the bus, I'm showing the guys, look, this is what you can do with an iPad. Took the card out of my camera, put in the card reader, stuck it in my iPad, logged into my Mac at home, remote desktop into my Mac, took the images from my camera, sent them to my computer, opened them in Lightroom, edited them, and then posted them from the back of the bus. Which seems like nothing today. But back actually, then- Actually, I didn't know you could do that. It, so it, it actually was something to me, yeah. It was mind-blowing. And it's not like I was editing them on my phone. Right, and then understand. No, no, I remote desktoped into my computer. Today, it's nothing. This was 2010. Wow, that's right. Yeah, 20, yeah. 2010 sounds right. And I freaking out right. everybody in the back of the back Freaking of the me out now. Yeah. It's 2023. <laughs> but to get yeah. back to your earlier point, is all of this actually photography? We've called this episode, Great Photography is All in Your Head yeah. for a reason. Because we're both of the opinion that- all that stuff gets in the way sometimes and if you send somebody out with a polaroid camera i know you're a polaroid fan Yes. I believe you're a Polaroid fan. I'm a fan. I don't have any, but I am a fan. Fan. Yeah. Yeah. Then it really wouldn't matter because the work of thinking about what you're going to produce and uh, getting it down on film or a sensor really should be possible with the simplest, I will say the simplest possible gear set. And anything beyond that's a bonus. You know, you want to add in a fancy telephoto lens, you want to add in a fancy this and that. That's great. Like, again, you're not going to get a photograph of a couple of lions basking in the sun on the Serengeti with an iPhone, but you will get photographs. You will yeah. get photography in the way we're defining it today. I think that's the point we're saying is that you don't need the most expensive gear. Certain photography, yes, you need the gear. But to go out and to shoot, we all have a camera in our pocket. Let's stop deriding it as saying it's not a camera, it's a cell phone. It is a camera. Yes. It takes great images and it's, it you have it with you all the time. There was a YouTube channel years ago, and I can't remember the name of it, where he would invite well-known photographers, commercial photographers, and he would give them a point and shoot camera. Camera, absolute basic camera and say, okay, here's a, you have a roll of film. I need you to go out. And the photographer would go out and with this basic point and shoot with, you know, it's built in flash. Sometimes he would bring little gels to put in front of the little flash, but he wasn't allowed to bring any ex other equipment, would go out and shoot superb photographs, proving that you don't need a $10,000 camera to get a, a great shot. You can do it with, with the equipment once you know what you're looking for and know how to get there. 
Yeah, that's I agree. The thing, how to get there. I'll tell you a story about how equipment got in my way. And this dates back to 2004. I went on a workshop with Freeman Patterson, who is certainly Canada's most distinguished and famous photographer. And I would venture to say one of the most distinguished and famous photographers in the world over the last, let's say, 40 years. And I went down to his workshop in New Brunswick. I was shooting film at this point, but I was in this phase for whatever reason where I would go out to do photography dressed in black. I would have a black vest on over a black t-shirt, black cargo pants, black sneakers. And I had this big belt that I would like strap onto myself with pouches for the lenses. And I would have looked like one of those guys in Black Hawk Down, you know, the Delta Force they dropped into Mogadishu. And, or except, Batman. Or, or Batman. <laughs> and not to mention a big tripod, a big Manfrotto tripod. So I must have looked like some kind of dangerous freak if you saw me. And I would wander around St. Anne de Bellevue, which is on the island of Montreal. And I would imagine people would have shut their doors if they saw me coming. Go down to New Brunswick. We're all loving being with Freeman Patterson, who's like 80 years old at this point. And he's all about an easy approach to photography. Never Never talks about the camera, just photograph, just learn to get in touch with your creative self and just photograph stuff. And we went into a cottage on his property on this particular day. And I was probably all kitted out of my stuff. And uh, Freeman was saying, okay, I want you to do this. He was giving us assignments. And me, he sent up through a skylight onto the roof of the cottage. And he said to me, you're going to have to take all that stuff off to get through the hole in my roof because you're not going to fit. And I thought, yeah, that's true. And I felt probably momentary anxiety, but then I took <laughs> my grappling hook is gone. <laughs> My grappling hook is gone. I stripped all this stuff off and went up top with whatever. I had like a, a Gogiri here, a Canon Alain 7 film okay. camera and a lens on it and went up top. And I realized afterwards, Freeman was saying, what are you doing? You idiot. Why are you covered <laughs> in 50 pounds worth of equipment? You're yeah. missing the whole point. And it stuck with me. And so when it came to iPhone photography, again, a few years later now, I would go out at work at lunch. I would go out, just wander around the building where the office was looking for interesting subject matter. Didn't matter what. If I saw that it was a, if I saw there was a rainbow outside, to the office I was working at was near some railroad tracks and there was a double rainbow. I ran out the back, got some great photographs with the iPhone, came back. And I was so happy and I would never have got those photographs, whatever value they've got, certainly to me in, in the sense that they captured that moment, that I would not have gotten if I'd been Johnny Delta Force Black <laughs> Ops photographer. Never would have happened. I have a similar story. I found myself in Cape Cod on vacation on the beach with my camera bag, my Pentax body with a motor drive, 14 lenses, <laughs> two flashes, 14? 14 lenses, two flashes and a tripod on the beach. And I remember sitting there and, I'm, and people are in the water and it's a beautiful day. It's sunny. And I'm terrified to go in the water because I have $20,000 of camera gear sitting under the umbrella and I'm terrified to take my eyes off it. Yeah. So I have to wait for my wife to come back out so that I can go into the water without her because I need someone to protect the gear. And I, I remember thinking, this is completely insane. Came home, sold everything. Sold yeah. the entire gear. Yeah, entire I kit said, I'm never doing this again. Not to mention the weight of it. I can't even imagine. Oh, the weight. Did I need a flash? I'm going on a beach <laughs> vacation. Do I need a flash? And did I use the flash? No. Did I use the tripod? No. How many of the 14 lenses did I use? Two, maybe. Richard, I used to carry a compass in my <laughs> photography vest on the West Island of Montreal. Like I was going to get lost in the parking lot at the mall and I would need to guide yeah, myself yeah. to my car with a compass. Yeah, what was yeah, I yeah, thinking? Yeah, 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 I probably yeah. had a knife in there somewhere, some kind of a Bowie knife. <laughs> You're in the mall. Bed, bath, and beyond Bed, bath, was and beyond. north. <laughs> Exactly. That means the Starbucks. Exactly. Is so 40 a paces. long, long way from photography <laughs> was that. You can easily get caught up in the gear. And, you yeah. know, there's the, the old gear acquisition syndrome. The lens you have is never good enough, then it's easy to get caught up in that. That's why we'll talk a little bit later about what gear do we have now? What are we shooting with now? Well, it should be noted that the image on the graphic for this episode, if you're looking at it, is a camera that we both love. That's really camera porn on that graphic. It's a, a half lit image of a camera that we both had to have about 10 years ago a Fuji X100. S uh, yeah. talked about it in an earlier episode. Had to have that camera. Couldn't sleep. Yeah. Had to have it. It's funny you say that because before I got the X100S, I got the X-Pro1, which was Fuji's first interchangeable mirrorless. I got that with a 35 1.4. The autofocus was unbelievably slow, but that oh. lens, that lens was just absolutely gorgeous. Right. At 1.4, it was tack sharp, beautiful. I took some really amazing shots. But I remember, this is like maybe 10 years after the famous Pentax strip. I was like, oh, maybe I need another lens. And I remember coming home again and going, I'm about to do it again. And that's when I sold the X-Pro and I went for the X100 because there are no lenses. It's a fixed lens camera. Right. Fixed lens camera, I can't buy another lens and I won't get caught in this. Self-denial, if you will. Self-denial, yeah. Well, you raised an interesting- I'm a holy man that way. <laughs> 
I think you are. <laughs> well, you raise an, an interesting topic, which is the topic of sharpness. Mm. As long as I've been involved in photography, I hear p- people talking about sharpness. And I find myself wondering, how fucking sharp can a picture get? I will analogize this to shaving. We now have razors with five blades, aloe strips, flexible heads. I've been shaving since probably 1975. I'm not sure I'm shaving any closer. And I was shaving with a single blade razor back then. So I do tend to wonder sometimes if we haven't brushed up against the threshold of sharpness, is it really all about sharpness? Like I'm not advocating for fuzzy out of focus pictures, but I think there's a cult of sharpness out there somewhere that probably needs to just kind of rein it in a little bit. According to my friend Norman, a real man shaves with a blowtorch. <laughs> hey, I'll bring in a Beatles story here. Somebody asked John Lennon once if he considered himself to be a great guitar player. And John said, if you want to talk about technical excellence, talk to George. All I know how to do is to make it fucking howl and move. And I think that's uh, oh, that can be applied nice. to art in general. There's the hyper-realistic painters, and we can respect that. Or there's people like Vincent Van Gogh who knew how to make it howl and move, I would yeah. say. I, I like that analogy. That, that's yeah. great, yeah. And you're right. I think there is the cult of sharpness. And I understand if you're shooting a nature photograph. Of course. The beauty is in the plumage of, of a bird, let's say. You don't want an out-of-focus bird. Otherwise, it's just a shape. It's the, I can't see the forest for the trees you know I can't see the image for the sharpness and we often we get caught up in that and I think the mood of the photo sometimes is is very important I'll take mood any day that's oh, yeah. me that I'll just put my cards on the table I'll take mood any day I'll take it what did you say howl and move make or, it howl and move I'd, I'd rather that than Sweeney Todd <laughs> <laughs> swinging, swinging that straight razor <laughs> yeah exactly yeah 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 <laughs> favorite subject to shoot you mentioned uh, yours before yeah um, so you go and then I'll, I'll kind of chime back in because okay. I'd like to hear what yours are it's very similar to you i like to shoot i'm obsessed these days with shadows reflections and shadows, especially in the house love them i've been starting a series slowly over the last year as the seasons change the light in my house is very different and i'll get these interesting reflections the problem is the camera is too smart and it's trying to compensate sometimes of course it is, yeah. <laughs> so i yeah. have to i have to uh, override the camera to get the imagery i want and often it, it might be a little statuette that's in the window sure and now the light comes through at an oblique angle and, and kind of distorts it so it looks like a monster is trying to come in or there'll be shapes there was a pot in the uh, dish rack and the spatula and the shadow it was casting looked just like Homer's head you know that round <laughs> head and yeah. he was holding a fly yeah. swatter over his head I pulled my wife out the back go look 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 it's Homer with a fly swatter not Homer the Greek author <laughs> rather but Homer Simpson right just yes. to be just Homer to be clear <laughs> that guy yeah. yeah those things fascinate me and I see faces everywhere and you know, we do as humans we tend to you know we'll see faces in trees yeah. I, I tend to see see a lot of those things and I like I like capturing them but these days it's the shadows also I'm kind of working on a series I'm calling up which is to photograph the ceilings in your house laying down on the floor and looking at the again it has to do with the light and angles the way light is being bounced off the walls and the way it appears in the ceilings we tend to disregard our ceilings we never look up see what's up and I find it's fascinating what's up in houses but also often in commercial buildings when you look up sometimes you'll see the exposed structure and I like those kind of things seeing structure and I think it's kind of lines shapes architecture angles shadows that kind of stuff I know exactly what you're saying. In my place where we are now, the semi-retired studio slash Dave's place. Slash uh, bunker. Slash bunker is very sunny. Yeah. Uh, this place yeah. lights up with sun. I've got horizontals in the front. I get beautiful horizontal shadows. And there are times, I haven't done it in a while now, where I've gone, man, that, this is just beautiful. Plays of light on the doorknobs, on the this yeah. and that. And I've got a bunch of photographs that I'm re- really, really happy with that were taken here. And it's always changing. I'm reminded of the video that Richard mentioned at the beginning of the episode yesterday about that guy talking about iPhonography and he's referring to a woman who, who was working in the New York Times building in New York City, Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And the outside of the building is covered with these horizontal metal bars that yeah. were put there as a, I don't know, an architectural feature slash protective device, something like that. But as a result of these horizontal bars, the offices fill up with these horizontal lines and the furniture inside is very modern, very graphic, very minimalist. I like that sort of stuff too. Yeah. And produces these incredible plays of light that she's photographed and turned into a book that's called called Office Romance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I thought was a cute title. Yeah, and it's all black and white too. All black and white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All black and white. So, you know what? I love that sort of photography getting back to, you know, in in terms, I'm happy to photograph the effects of light on anything Mm -hmm. as opposed to, again, a particular subject. Effects of light on a flower, effects of light on a a manhole cover in the street. Doesn't matter to me. You see this often in Japanese architecture where window coverings, whether they're outside or architectural details are put there specifically 
to cast shadows or to channel the light in such a way inside the house that as the season and as the you know as the time of day passes and as the seasons change you get you get an interesting interplay of shadows in your house so that the light becomes more than just light it also becomes like almost a living being in your house well that's fascinating yeah, I had it's no fascinating. Idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah so you'll have sometimes steel panels with leaves cut out and lasered out of the okay oven. and then as the light comes through that you'll get this interplay through across walls and th- different seasons when the sun like in winter the sun tends to be a bit lower you will get a different play of light it's fascinating i love that idea of architecture not just holding up your house but helping to give a mood and a feeling on the inside of the house what a great Beautiful. idea yeah. that's a great idea you're familiar no doubt with the, the work of paul strand yes okay so paul strand again for non-photographers was a like an american photographer active in the 1910s something in that period and he produced this type of photograph we're describing so he's one of my favorite earlier photographers as a result of that he's not photographing a horse-drawn carriage in new york city he's photographing the effect of light on the world around him for me he's a very inspirational photographer Completely different to the Freeman Patterson we were taught. Well, that's not even true. I shouldn't say that. Freeman does that sometimes as well. Very much so. So let me take that back. But Paul's stuff, all black and white because of the era he was in, is again, very, very stripped down, minimalist stuff that's just photographing light. We've spoken of our favorite subjects to photograph. Let's let's flip it on its head here. What's your least favorite subject to photograph? Okay. And I don't mean math. <laughs> so my least favorite and it's because i'm not comfortable doing it and i wish i was is photographing people other than immediate family when it comes to photographing people again i maybe have a half dozen that i'm i'm happy with from all those years past but i'm generally too worried that they're going to notice me and object to what i'm doing so i tend to photograph people from far away or not not facing the camera so they have no idea what i'm doing so they become a shape in a graphic composition mm-hmm. as opposed to a person where I'm capturing part of their life story. I wish I could do that. I'm haunted always by, haunted always is a strong statement, but I remember being in Paris. The only time in my life I was in Paris, 20 years ago, had my camera. I was in the Montmartre area. This sounds awfully snobby. I don't mean it to. So it could be old Montreal. But anyways, Mm. I looked up on this particular building and there was an old woman leaning out of a window, not far above my head. And she had a black cat next to her on the windowsill. And it was beautiful. I was like, I need to take this picture now. This is an award-winning photograph. And of course, I was too slow. I probably had all the gear on me. And I was nervous she'd see me and start screaming and call gendarmes or something like that. So by the time I pulled myself together, she had withdrawn inside the window and the shot was gone. And that's me all over with people photography. I'm not good at it because I'm I'm too shy to do it is what it comes down to. What's nice is that photograph does live in your head. A lot of stuff living no, in my head, yeah. But I'm, I'm not naked saying that to be facetious. I, I There are images sometimes that I see that I don't take. Sometimes I see something and I want to, I, I need to capture it just for myself. I don't need to share it with someone. I don't need to capture it. I was there in the moment. I lived it, but the photograph lives in my head. So I'll go back to my least favorite subject. There's a scene in the Ben Stiller movie, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, which came out within the last 10 years. Which I've not seen. No. Yeah. The basis of the movie is, is Life Magazine is closing down. It's going digital and their last print issue is coming out. And Ben Stiller plays the photo editor. He's been there for like oh, 25 like to watch years. That. Yeah. It's fantastic. Okay. Of course, now I'm going to spoil it for you, Dave. No, what, I'll block my ears so the audience can hear it, but I can't. I'll just see your mouth moving. So he comes across, he finds who he's looking for, photographing something rare. And he's like, are you going to take the photo? Are you going to take the photo? And he goes, no, sometimes I like to keep it just for me. And I, I don't uh, want to photograph. This moment is too right. special to capture. And he goes, let's go play soccer. The way it was put, it really encompassed something that I sometimes feel. I'm not going to say it cheapens it to take the photo of it, but sometimes it's like, I feel like if I've taken the photo, I have to show someone else and I don't want to. It's a moment that I experienced and I wanted just for me. That's really nice, I think. And uh, I think it gets at what we're talking about, which is the essence of photography, which isn't necessarily recording everything around you in a literal sense. Mm-hmm. The cheap food photographs that show up all over Instagram yeah. or whatever. Yeah. In this case, you chose not to photograph photograph it, but I bet had you done so, I would suspect with your level of skill and approach, it would have been an engaging image. I will throw that out there. So the thing I least like photographing again is like you, David, it it is people, which is not ironic, but as part of my job when I was working, uh, I had to photograph people as part of my job. I would replace the photographer.
for uh, when he wasn't there. And so I would have to often shoot events. So a lot of event photography, which okay. would be photographing. It could be uh, an awards banquet. You stand in place, you yeah. photograph people as they get their award. Kind of simple. That stuff was pretty, you know, once you warm up the eye, you go boom, boom, you shoot pretty much from the same angle. You get a good headshot of the person receiving their award, shaking hands with their prize. Those are simple. What I don't like is portraiture more than anything. Portraiture also, I, I would guess like street photography when you're right in someone's face and you're photographing them. I, yeah. find, I find it somewhat yeah. invasive. I, I've been photographed like that one time. I remember walking down St. Catherine Street and I saw the guy walking and he's got a camera around his neck and he looks at me right in the eye and as, as I'm five feet from me, he just lifts the camera with looking me straight in the eye. Never looks down at the camera, just tilted the camera up, took a picture. Well, that's the classic technique, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I thought it was great. It was great. I just, I, I it's not something I feel comfortable with and I can't explain really. And you know what? Really, I should have said street photography yeah. five minutes ago that you've said it so I'm not yeah. try, I don't mean to interrupt but yeah it's street photography that I can't get my head wrapped around portraiture for me I find very hard and here, here's the reason why I've been asked to shoot weddings and I've refused I don't have the skill set or the confidence to shoot someone's wedding because it is a one time event <laughs> if you screw up someone's wedding it's not like they're going to do it again next weekend so that you can get the pictures but I've been asked to, to shoot uh, portraits uh, we had I'd taken some photos for an annual report at work and when the chairman of the board liked the photo and had invited me to his place to his, his place of work to shoot portraits of him in his office in Placeville Marie. I'm telling you, I never sweated so much in my life. I, bet, I showed I up, bet, yeah. seven lenses, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> over geared, ended up taking a few photos. I don't know if he ever used them, but to me, that was terrifying because when it comes to portraiture, you're not shooting for yourself now. Right, you're right. Now you're shooting something for the client and you want them to appreciate what you've done. I am not some famous photographer and they're going to say, okay, do it and whatever you do will have to be good because you are you. <laughs> this is not it. I'm here to take photographs of the man in his office that he's going to use on his publications, his website, whatever it's going to be. And you have to satisfy the client. Usually the, the only client I have to satisfy is me. And yeah. that I know what to do, how to do. But to satisfy <laughs> a very successful man with photos, you know, and that he's called me out personally to do this thing. And the photo, I find that very intimidating. And I, I don't like that. I don't want to disappoint, I think is what it is. Well, I understand what you're saying. A, a job I had recently, I was responsible for communications at a company to put on a lot of big company events where a lot of people would attend. And I discovered that they didn't have any decent event photography yeah. uh, as I reviewed the inventory and decided, okay, I'll shoot some events. It was my idea. No one expected anything of me. I was producing, I would have to say, better results than they had uh, on file, but the standard was very low. And I was okay with that. Again, people on stage getting trophies and yeah. so on and so forth. But if somebody had said, hey, can you take a photograph of CEO that's going to be used? I think I might have said, you know what? That's not my gig because I would not have had the confidence to do it exactly as you said it and to record this man or woman in an optimal way I just I'm not trained to do that no. I would have backed away from that really really quickly because I might have just screwed that up out of sheer nervousness I might have nailed it but I doubt it and I did photograph a wedding once I was asked by a family member to photograph a wedding because you know Dave's a photographer I said yes because I felt I needed to say yes and they were it's all oh, they're counting on you and they don't have a lot of money I was like okay I was just gonna do it for the cost of the film and I had a horrible time because exactly as you said it I realized what I was responsible for. Mm. And if I fucked up, it was going to reverberate for the rest of their yeah. lives. The part of their wedding experience would be crappy photographs from this guy, Dave. And so I was never happier than when the photographs came back. They weren't bad. I went to their house. They were back from their honeymoon, said, here's the photographs. They seemed happy with them. And I got out of there and I was like, I'm never doing that again. It did give me a newfound respect for wedding photographers at oh, the yeah. time, which I, for no good reason, probably didn't have. Yeah. I was like, man, you guys take a lot on. Yeah, I have experience with that. My brother's a photographer and often would shoot weddings. Uh, me and my younger brother would often assist. And we'd spend the day with him as he's, you know, throwing camera backs at you as you're switching <laughs> yeah, out yeah, the yeah, film, yeah, yeah. loading the film up yeah. so that you're always ready. It's something to see someone who knows their craft and can organize the people. Because when you're going, you got a wedding party, you got yeah. 30, 40 people. They're all standing there. And for them to see them go, okay... Where are we going? Over here. And next thing you know, they're all perfectly lined up. The feet are facing the right way. They're smiling. There's no hair in the face. There's no flower in, in front of someone's face and snapping this and producing that regularly. It's it's quite something. It's something I don't have in me. Honestly, I'm not interested by it. We talked about what we like. Not a type of photography I'd be attracted yeah. to doing, but I respect it a lot. On the other side of that, part of my job too, covering uh, photography uh, at work, was I had to photograph the dead. And that's the end of part one. Next Tuesday, part two drops on Semi-Retired. You won't want to miss it. <laughs>